Hey everybody, Greg Cazillo from Cazillo.com. Here we are again with Kathy and questions from Kathy. I like that. I think it's kind of cute. We might have to keep that, but then I guess everyone that has questions for me is always going to have to be named Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it last week. There were some really good comments. So here is part two. I don't know if there's going to be a part three or part four or uh, part infinity there may end up being, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. So. Uh, what other questions did you have for me? Well, I know by now things that you probably do are routine and you don't even have to think about them. Mm -hmm. But when you did have to think about them, what are some of the things that you thought when you were preparing for a shoot as far as what lens am I going to take, what aperture am I going to be shooting at, things like that? Well, I'd always take all the equipment that I had or uh, the majority of the lenses that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and of course now you always want to take that second body in case there is an issue right. or a problem like all the problems we've been having today. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something that's going to go on. Your microphone issues. <laughs> it happens. Um, I wish there was another backup microphone to make that work. <laughs> but um, so the, your body, your obviously film when I was first starting, I always take a bunch of film, memory cards, got to have a lot of those. but really the, the one thing that mattered was the lenses and lens selection to me and of course lighting um when i first started i didn't have many strobes i only had maybe one flash mm -hmm. and i didn't use it much right because like most people they're didn't know how they're, to <laughs> did, either didn't know how or they were it, it never came out the way they wanted it to come out is usually the problem it's a little scary it's yeah intimidating. and it still happens to me a lot mm -hmm. where i do something and it's like, okay, that's not working, start over or just scrap it and do it and take another angle. Mm -hmm. um, but lens selection really has, I think, a lot to do with just knowing it and trying it and not just grabbing one lens and doing it, but going back and forth, trying different things in different scenes and um, maybe going onto a Flickr account and browsing and looking at the metadata and seeing what lens they shot with mm -hmm. or what um, maybe the aperture although that's uh, the exposure settings I think are a little bit more irrelevant rather than maybe the zoom position like where they were zoomed in and uh, the lens that they chose I think that's a little bit more important rather than exposure because really the main the main point of exposure is going to affect the image is your aperture and I think we did we talk about that last time. I, can't I think remember. we did a little bit last time, and on <laughs> round two of this one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So explain that uh, when you're going to shoot. Let's say that you're shooting a family of four. How do you know what lens you want to use and what your aperture is going to be? Well, number one is the scene that we're in. All right, is it a really busy scene where I need to blur the background because I got stuff that's potentially coming out of their heads, or mm -hmm. people in the background, or stuff in the back that doesn't look good? You know, or is it a really nice scene where I want to bring that in and I want to really make them a part of that scene? Um, you know, is it more of an environmental kind of portrait? And how are you going to blur the background as far as, is it a function of your lens? Is it a function of how close you are? It, there's a lot of those. Number, it is how close. Uh, there's a number of functions that'll tell you, that'll give you either more or less bokeh. Number one, obviously, is your aperture. So the, if you have a fixed aperture lens, so you shoot at 2.8 or f4, it's going to give you more, the wider open you are, the more light you're going to let in, the more shallow your depth of field is going to be. All right, that's number one. Number two, the closer you are to the subject, the blurrier it's going to be. So if you would have, it'd take two portraits, and this is a, a great example that everybody can yeah. do to, to see the concept. You take, the, take a portrait of someone or something, at the same zoom position with the same camera, the same settings, everything, but one of them is, is closer, say it's a headshot of someone. You take that headshot with the same zoom position at 200 millimeters and the only thing you do is back up and refocus mm -hmm. so that you get the entire body mm -hmm. and the bokeh is going to be, a, a, you're going to have a lot more bokeh and it's going to be a lot blurrier in the background with the headshot okay. versus the uh the full body okay okay and that's a function of the distance so the closer you are the more compression and the more um the background is relatively farther away 
uh, from the background, so or the from the subject. So mm -hmm. that means you're going to have more of it blown out. Okay, so let's go in the opposite direction. Let's say you have a sports team or a big family that you're trying to shoot several rows of people. Mm -hmm. I know you focus a third of the way in, but what kind of aperture are you looking at when you're doing something like that? I'm usually going to start around four, maybe 5.6. Mm -hmm. And then um, the way I like to explain it is, is it, it also depends on your lens. Mm -hmm. All right. Are you, if you have a really wide lens and, you have a, and you're set on a wide setting, so say you're at 24 millimeter with a 24 to 70 lens. Okay. Okay. You're gonna have a much deeper depth, depth of, of field, field than if you were at 70 millimeter on that same lens at that same aperture. Okay. Okay. Some of the old 50 millimeter lenses actually used to have a scale on them that told you if you're at X Y, you know, if you're at uh, 10 feet focus at f 5.6, you'll have two feet of uh, depth of field. I never paid attention to that scale. I just kind of did it uh -huh. and, and just from experience, just experience it and knew, you knew what I wanted. Now it's even easier because you could just turn it back your screen on, look at <laughs> it and say, okay, is that sharp? Is that not sharp? Uh -huh. You know, it's real easy to be able to zoom in to one to one and see if something's good or bad. Um, but uh, number one lens selection. So if I'm using a wider lens and I'm in a wider zoom uh, angle, that means that I'm going to be using I don't need as much. So you can use a lower aperture. So I can use it at 5.6 okay. or maybe F4 to push it. Okay. Whereas if I'm using the 70 to 200 or I'm zooming in a little bit more, then I might need to go a little bit more to you know 5.6, F8, something like that. All right. um, if you're talking three, four rows, you probably want to start at, say, 5.6, okay, and still make sure to use that rule of thirds. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, uh, A lot of that, though, is unfortunately, is trial and error and, and playing with a little bit because um, you're also going to have a little bit of barrel distortion, a lot of other technical stuff that, mm -hmm. that could make your edges a little bit more out of focus. Mm -hmm. And actually, if everyone is in a straight line in front of you, mm -hmm. realistically, the people on the, the edges, edges are actually farther away than the people in right. the front. So they're going to be more blurry. Exactly. Okay. So they're really not parallel. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. That makes sense. So they're... they're, they're they, if you curve them in a little bit, mm -hmm. you will actually keep them in focus a little oh, right. bit better. So, okay, so you're going to position them so that, ah, exactly. yeah, nice little trick. Exactly, trade. yeah. Um, you do that with big groups a lot. Okay. Small groups, it's not really a big deal, mm -hmm. but big groups, like I would do that where 40, 50, 100 people. Like class reunion kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. where you have bleachers or a lot of chairs or a lot of mm -hmm. something, and so you, those, those last three, four, five on the end, or you know, or you curve it a little bit so that you're bringing them in closer mm -hmm. and keeping, the, keeping them in focus. And probably artistically, it's a little more appealing as well than the straight yeah. boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you're raising your aperture, some other things on your camera have to change as far as yep. ISO and stuff. Can you explain that a little you'll, bit? Yeah, you'll adjust your ISO. You want to keep your shutter speed high enough so that you don't have any people shake, as I like to call it. <laughs> so, and we talked about last time, the length of your lens can dictate that too. Mm -hmm. Yep, the, the length of the lens, if your um, lens is say 200 millimeters, you, or you probably want to be above one two hundredth of a second. Right. But again, that's only stopping the, your hands from shaking, the mm -hmm. camera from shaking. Mm -hmm. That's not stopping the, the little kid from running across <laughs> and not uh, you know, stopping his motion. Mm -hmm. And neither is VR. VR isn't going to stop his motion right, either. it's just stopping yours. Yeah, it's only stopping yours. So it's still important, in my opinion, you know, even it, whether you use VR or not, to still keep your shutter speed high enough because it's going to make a difference. Right. All right, there are times when you know that your subject is going to be standing very still for you and you need, you know, you want to keep your shutter speed a little bit lower or you want to keep your ISO a little bit lower. Maybe you're maxed out on your ISO. Mm -hmm. All right, and you need that extra stop of, of light in order to get a good exposure, a good mm -hmm. solid exposure. Then you'll turn on your VR and you need to really kind of pull yourself in and, and try and squeeze it off real well or Don't use breathe. a tripod. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you breathe in between. Right, I find myself <laughs> doing that. I'm going to pass out one day. Um, um, but how about ISO? How high is reasonable to be able to go? I'm a little camera shy with my old D50. If I push okay. it to 1600, which was its max. Yep. It, it was a little scary. Yep, they can be. Uh, it's a, it's a, there's a couple things in there. Number one, you got to have a good exposure. 
Okay. The camera manufacturers, believe it or not, know what they're doing. They know how to get a good exposure. They've done all the work. They got some really smart people over there, and they they know that you're going to have um, that uh, if you properly expose an image with a high ISO, it's going to look better than if you underexposed it by just keeping your exposure down. And have to fix it and like yeah. Mm -hmm. So an image with that shot at f4 at 200th of a second at ISO 1600, a stop under, isn't going to look as good as if it was exposed normally at 3200. Because right. you're still going to have to open it up and fix it, mm -hmm. which is then going to bring in your grain mm -hmm. or your noise, and it's just not going to look as good. Right. So exposing properly with the camera is number one. Uh, number two is how big are you going to make it? If you're only going to 8x10, 5x7, 11x14, the print size. Mm -hmm. Or even if you're just showing it on screen, mm -hmm. you don't need as much, you know, you can go with that much higher ISO. Like these are 16x20 prints behind us here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 16x20s. And that's small to me. You know, a big print is 60 inches, okay. 70 inches, 80 inches. That's a big print so to me. So you're still okay with something like that going with the higher ISO? Oh, yeah. You get a good exposure. And you know you have a good, good strong light source, or your flash is in there mixed well. It's still going to look really good, all right. And if you need to, it can always be turned into a happy accident by bringing in the black, black and, white, and white, and fixing it, and making it look artistic. Yeah. Maybe adding a little <laughs> bit more noise to it yeah. to make it a little more grainy or a little more something if you really needed to. Okay. So just you know you can always try and save it if you had to, but. Don't be shy about it. Just do it. About the ISS. Just do it, yeah. Um, four years ago when Nikon let out the D3, believe me, it was like an, an eye-opener to be able to shoot at 6400. I mean, I try and stay below that 6400 on my D3 yeah. whenever possible. Mm -hmm. But if I have to, you can. I have to. Yeah. You know, it's as simple as that. If I I'd always err on the side of better exposure... The first time around. Yep. Yeah. Rather than having to fix it in post mm -hmm. and something be wrong. Okay. So now you've gotten your lens picked, you've got your aperture and shutter speed and exposure all picked. You're going to a family photo shoot. Mm -hmm. What's going through your head when you first get there? What well, are you doing? I actually leave my bag in the car when I first walk up. Mm -hmm. I'm not even carrying it in. I'm casing the place to see what's good, what's mm -hmm. bad. And actually, I should probably shouldn't say bad. I should just say more difficult. Here's my cap I was playing with. <laughs> so there's going to be some lighting scenarios that are going to be more difficult. So if you're working with only artificial light, like what we have in here, mm -hmm. might be a little more difficult to work with rather than adding some available light. Or maybe you have a skylight with a very strong light source coming in, very strong sunny day, and that sun's coming straight down. It's going to be very difficult to mix that light and make it work in, in a lot of situations because it's probably going to be a lot darker all the way around it. Mm -hmm. All right, or you might have a backlit window, whatever it may be. It's you know looking around, seeing number one what they want, mm -hmm. what their what their expectations are, but then number two, what can we work with lighting wise that's mm -hmm. going to make it all work together. How about outdoors? What are you looking for for a good background, good setting? Um, a lot of times, backgrounds that are far away are good. When they're farther away, I get more bokeh, more blurred out, more everything that that looks better to me. So you're sitting your clients further, closer to you than whatever's behind them, so that whatever's behind yep. them is going to be blown. Yep, exactly. So um, you know, you take a picture of someone in front of a in front of a house, and they're standing five feet in front of it. That's great. That's all well and good. But if you turn around and you have these trees in the background, they're a couple hundred feet away. They're going to be nice and blurry and out of focus, and they're going to look really good. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have the picture's going to be less about the house and more about the person. The subject, right? But then again, if they wanted pictures of the house with mm -hmm. them, obviously you don't have a choice. So, again, it really comes down to what what you want to create, what the person wants you to create. Okay. And how do you go about posing people so that they feel comfortable? I find that in the beginning, the first couple pictures are almost <laughs> always throwaways because they're so stiff and they relax the more I talk to them. They and, are, yeah. So and actually, help. back in the day, I always used to not even put the first roll of film in the camera. Ah, the first roll, roll of film you, was always, you know, say 10, 15 pictures in. Uh -huh. You know, say, oh, I got to switch, change my film. And I would actually then put one, put the first uh -huh. one in because they were just stiff, stiff. and stodgy and they didn't know what they're doing. 
Um, it's all about that relationship and making sure that they see that you're comfortable with what you're doing, you're knowledgeable, mm -hmm. but that you're not. The one thing that I see a lot of people do is they're fumbling with their equipment. That's on your um, ebook too. Yeah, and that's hard when you're new, remembering aperture, ISO, yeah. shutter speed, where should I be? Yeah, but it really isn't because all you have to do is look at the scale in the camera. And like I talked about before, start off by, I, I shoot in an aperture priority mode in my head before I'm even shooting the picture, before I'm looking in the that camera. I'm seeing it and I'm thinking about, okay, aperture is first to me. Mm -hmm. I'm setting that first. Whether the camera's on manual or not, in my head, I'm in aperture priority mode. Mm -hmm. And for okay. aperture, you mean what is it going to look like? What is the, the final picture yep. going to look like in the background? How what much depth of field see? do I want? Right, what, what's going to yep. be clear? That's first. Mm -hmm. Then once I have that set in my head, then everything else just falls in. Mm -hmm. My shutter speed needs to be around a 200th, mm -hmm. okay? And then my ISO is whatever it is. Yeah. So it's a little bit, people I think make it a little more difficult than it's it actually is. a lot to think about. I mean, I, now that I've been doing it for a while, a few yeah. months, it's becoming more natural. But in the beginning, you might look in, in your screen mm -hmm. and you see that it's not right, but what do I want to do? What do I need to do about it? Yep, mm -hmm. yep. And I don't know how to do it right now. Well, you got to like read this. that scale. Yeah. You, you know, pay attention to that scale on the inside of the camera. Mm -hmm. Bring it up, bring it down. That's uh, just a matter of playing with that. And practicing what makes pra it come up and Exactly. Down. And practice it before you go out on that shoot or mm -hmm. work with someone. Because knowing your equipment is, is half of it. Mm -hmm. Being able to um, not get frustrated and be able to do stuff and easily scared. and change. <laughs> yeah, not show that you're scared. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Don't let them see you sweat. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> So that's big, but then talking to them, make sure that they're comfortable. Um, if there's kids involved, make sure, you know, if you usually, if you can get the kids to like you, mm -hmm. that means the parents are going to like you too. Yeah. So that's a, that's a good way to go. Or the dog, you know, if the dog <laughs> likes you, then, it, you yeah. know, that's usually a good way to go yeah. too. So. And I'm finding that I like to tell the parents to let me handle it because they're, Sam, sit up straight. Sam, smile. To a Sam, point, and yeah. the kids get upset. Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. I agree. You've gotten to your place. You've judged what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You've figured out what all your settings are going to be. You've gotten the pictures and you've gotten home. Walk me through what you do when you download your pictures. What do you do when you first see the picture come up on your screen? Uh, so I'm already home and I'm done. You're done. The shoot's done. Yeah. Uh, well, first I copy the photos over from the card reader, okay, or maybe you have one built in your in your laptop or your computer. So, and then I use either the Finder, Mac Finder, or the Windows Explorer. Mm -hmm. I don't like to use Lightroom to copy the photos over. Why not? Uh, I just don't like it. Okay. I feel as if sometimes it's one more program in the way, and I feel as if it could. And this is probably just an anal thing or just a, a, a habit thing. Uh -huh. I prefer to not have as many problems or issues in the middle. Okay. So if I can avoid another problem, I'd rather just have Windows copy it over. Um, and if you really wanted to get anal, there are programs that will copy photos over and then um, check to make sure that they were copied correctly. Ooh. And I've often thought about doing that. Uh -huh. But then... I figure, you know what, I don't really need to because Lightroom is reading them right away anyway. Mm -hmm. And if there is an issue, I'll know that there's a problem. Okay. So, you so bring, when you bring it up in Lightroom, then... So copy them over, then um, I'm, I'm actually creating a, a new folder first. Mm -hmm. And so all the photos are in a single folder or in its own hard drive. Mm -hmm. So I'm creating a new folder, which has the four-digit year, two-digit month, and then two-digit day, right. which keeps it in a nice chronological mm -hmm. order, I do mine which too. is easy for me to find, mm -hmm. and then an underscore, and then the client name, or the product name, or whatever it is that I'm working with, and then the type of photo. So it'll be portraits, or wedding, or event, or okay. scenic, or landscape, mm -hmm. or product, or whatever it could be, you know, I would at the very end of that. Mm -hmm. So I can quickly scan and say, okay, I'm looking for my product photos. I'm looking mm -hmm. for my uh, portraits that I did this year, or weddings I did this year, or whatever, so I can easily see right. what's going on mm -hmm. in those. All right. Um, and by the way, this it, it's hard to understand. That's in the ebook too. 
<laughs> and it's also, you did a whole thing on organizational systems in Lightroom. Workflow, yeah. Right, workflow. Yeah. So I'm thinking more, you're, you've got the image on the screen. What mm -hmm. are you looking at? What are you looking to see? Decide how to edit it. Um, well, first round is, is more about the getting rid of my bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Deleting, going through them. So once they're deleted and the metadata is added and the, um, so maybe some keywords are in there and I've renamed and I'm figuring out what images I'm going to show the client. Mm -hmm. All right. They're what I consider to be my one star images. Mm -hmm. Then maybe I'll edit a few, but I typically don't do a whole lot of editing before I show them to the client. And that's a personal preference okay. because a lot of other photographers want them totally a hundred percent edited before showing the client. But to me, I, I'm not going to do a lot to them in the end anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's not really my style. So I'm not going to edit. And I also don't want to spend a ton of time on them. You know, if I spend two hours on a set of photos, I could have that two hours doing something else. Especially if the client more. picks two of them and you've edited 20. Exactly. Then. Exactly. And so, um, like here in the, in, the, in the office, I pull down the big screen mm -hmm. and I got a 50 inch screen, sorry, 150 inch screen mm -hmm. that they're looking at projected image with Lightroom on the computer. Mm -hmm. If they want to see something fancy, I'll make it fancy right there in front of them mm -hmm. so that they can see it. Okay. And it's a little more wow anyway, rather than have them completely edited and spending hours and hours on stuff. So I'm not big on doing a lot of that before. Okay. Uh, I will make a few black and white, make some general changes, make sure that the color and contrast looks good, the white balance is good, and then I'll either invite them in to show them everything, or I'll at that point um, post them online for them to view. So your pictures you think look fairly sharp when you just pull them into Lightroom? Yep. Yeah, my, my exposures are good. My, yeah. my I mean, if something is out of focus, it's trash. Right. If If something is too far gone as far as exposure and I can't save it. If I did screw up on something, yeah. then it's trash. But like I said, sometimes there are the happy accidents that I can right. save stuff. You know, maybe I've had actually some really cool photos that have been overexposed by like three or four stops yeah. and turned into some awesome black, black and, and whites. whites. Yeah, I'll have to have you look at some things because I think sometimes when you bring things into Lightroom, until you add a little bit of clarity, mm -hmm. they just look a little... They look weird to me. They can. Yeah, they can. A lot of times I'll go with a little bit of clarity, but then also a little bit of, uh, I'll go the, the dark tone curve. Mm -hmm. uh, not dark. The strong contrast tone curve. Mm -hmm. I'll apply that to a lot of photos. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit of black level to, yeah. a, to a lot of them to that's bring that up. That's what I'm doing too, um, yeah. Which, if you're adjusting your black level, that's the proper way to edit. That means you have a good base exposure. Okay, <laughs> that you've exposed to the right uh -huh. because Lightroom is made to recover data from the highlights, mm -hmm. and you have 50% of your data is in the highlights, that first stop of information. Mm -hmm. That's where 50% of the photo is as far as the data in the file. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you don't have that flat spot in the histogram, mm -hmm. it's pushed over to the right. That means you're saving that data, and then you then bring in those darks. So you've exposed for the highlights, right? Okay. Make sure you're not overexposed, but you still have a good amount of data in your highlights, and then you print for the shadows. So if you are overexposed, will you have that flat spot or you have a peak? Uh, well, peaks can sometimes be good. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this particular scene, if I was taking a picture this way, you can't really see these overhead lights. Mm -hmm. The camera, the camera can't. But these overhead lights here, they're going to have a peak. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we don't care because we're exposing for skin, mm -hmm. okay? So we might also have a peak from the background depending upon how bright we are, mm -hmm. okay? That's okay, right? because it doesn't matter. We, you know, we're not worried about getting detail in the light bulb. You know, we don't want right. to read the, li the writing on the right. light bulb. So we yeah. want to be able to see uh -huh. the face. Right. You know, that's gonna be much more important to get that. So, um, some, so sometimes little peaks and stuff are good in a photo. It's just a matter of not having that flat spot. But again, you also need to think about the the overall image itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, is it mostly um, how can I put it? Er, knowing your histogram, your histogram, there is no such thing as a perfect histogram. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Okay, there's a, maybe a perfect one for this particular image, but then the next one you take might be, be completely different. Right. 
just because the the subject matter changed, the background changed, the anything changed. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why we say as a general rule of thumb, exposing to the right is better. Now the one time that I always break that rule is actually for shooting sunsets. Mm -hmm. I almost always underexpose my sunsets by a stop or two stops. Because? Because they look better. <laughs> because? <laughs> They're, you're underexposing. You want sunsets to, uh, you want a sunset to be, have a very, very um, saturated colors mm -hmm. and very dark colors. Mm -hmm. When you underexpose it, you're making the colors darker. Gotcha. Okay. So that also means you have more detail in your sky or in like the sun as it's coming mm -hmm. down or the clouds or whatever it that may be. Sense. And you can really get some awesome color out of that, out of that sunset when it looks like that. So that's, that's one time I almost always underexpose. Excellent. All right. Um, do you use anything external for editing like a Wacom, Wacom well, yeah, tablet? Yeah. I think that's how they say it, Wacom. Wacom? Yeah. <laughs> like Wacom old, Wacom. <laughs> I'm thinking the Wacom Suckum game with yep. the little robots. I think that was how they said it last year when I was up at the, the show. Okay. Um, yeah, but the, uh, I have one. I have one about mm -hmm. the size of my iPad. I don't use it a lot, though. Okay. Um, what would you use it for? When would it be handy? When I have to edit a lot of pictures. Because it alleviates strain. Yes, Super. it's so much easier to use than a mouse. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Even though this, even I have no, I have the small one. It's still easier to use mm -hmm. than the mouse, uh, especially if I need to edit something very fine. I find myself being much better with the pen rather mm -hmm. than the mouse. Um, but again, I, I don't use it a whole lot because I don't edit my pictures a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Even, I mean, maybe the extent that I'm going to edit is. Uh, just maybe some blemish removal or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the heaviest thing that I'm gonna do and that's gonna okay. take me three minutes to do anyway and I'm done. So I'm not gonna grab the tablet just to do, to do those right. one or two pictures. So, mm -hmm. so speaking limited. of editing, what kind of things are you seeing in photography right now that you like and don't like editing wise? Because there are a lot of different looks out there. There are. I'm not a fan of anything that's heavily edited. Mm -hmm. I don't like photos that you see, and even some of my favorite photographers do this. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they'll they'll darken everything around the people. If it's a portrait, I don't like that. I don't like a whole lot of vignette. Um, I don't like a whole lot of um, the colorized or uh, adjusted colors, or you know, I think everything needs to be in moderation. Mm -hmm. um, so more like a natural. Yeah, color, a little, just more a more natural it. color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although even sometimes I go back and look at some of my edits and I say, man, mm -hmm. why was I so heavy handed on that mm -hmm. sky? Why did I go so uh -huh. far? You know, a little bit too much. But um, I find I can get that way if I've been working on pictures for a really long time and I've been sitting in front of the monitor for a really long time. Yeah. I don't know if you just get kind of blinded by you it. Do. You do. You do. You get. Um, I used to have a term for that that I used to well, call like it something. It's like perfume. The, the more you wear, you yeah. more get used to it, and the more you have to put on exactly. before you smell it. Exactly. So yeah, you gotta. It's got to be definitely a moderation thing to be able to walk away or look outside the window or Blink a few something. Times. Yeah, something to be able to look off because you do kind of get. I don't want to say color blind, but you kind of get blinded by strain, the screen. Probably, yeah. yeah. So. How do you moderation? Keep, okay. How do you keep track of your photographic workflow? What projects you've got coming up? What projects you're middle of editing? The ones you're waiting for mm -hmm. clients? The, it can start to get overwhelming when you've got a bunch of things going on. It can. Actually, I'd use the whiteboard. I was thinking about buying it. I have a poster <laughs> that I tacked up in my office until I get a whiteboard. I've got a big whiteboard right next to my desk. Uh -huh. And actually, I've got another one over as you walk in the office, which you can kind of mm -hmm. see. I think you can see it. In the back in of some videos? of my videos, okay. uh, there, there's two small ones, one above another. You can uh -huh. you can see that they're hanging there, uh, but everything else is actually just in um, uh, Outlook, mm -hmm. Microsoft Outlook, mm -hmm. which has all my email and everything anyway, mm -hmm. and then calendar. You know, I put a lot of things in the calendar, and actually the new thing with the the new iPhone is actually really nice because it integrates with Outlook, the new tasks and yeah, reminders. Okay. Uh -huh. So that is really nice. It integrates so now I can actually use the tasks that are on the new iPhone 4S and then they go right into Outlook, which is awesome. They keep you straight. Yep, because I like, 
you know, I already have my mail, my contacts, and my calendar all in Outlook and on my phone, and they automatically synchronize. Now I have my reminders and tasks, mm -hmm. which is even better. Okay, so, so with the business side of it, how do you keep track of the accounting? Uh, QuickBooks. QuickBooks. Everything goes in QuickBooks, and then put it in QuickBooks, and hopefully the accountant doesn't tell me that I did anything wrong. <laughs> and you can do invoices and things like that through that too? Yeah. Do you do contracts with your clients? Uh, limited ones, mm -hmm. limited ones. I have a, a contract that I wrote up on, I don't know how many years ago for portraits or weddings, mm -hmm. which is pretty simple. It's simple English, it's, you know, a lawyer didn't draw it up, mm -hmm. although I did have one look over it at one mm -hmm. point. Um, so what kind of stuff is on it? Like, uh, it's, it's, li it's little stuff like, um, I always require that uh, myself and the other photographer that I'm working with at a wedding mm -hmm. are seated with the guests and are given the guest meal. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually in my wedding contract because that's important to me. Uh -huh. You know, I want to be able to make sure that I'm not missing anything uh -huh. and that they're not, I'm not stashed away in some long corner, you know, on the other side of the building or given some horrible sandwich that they made three days ago. You know, that's just not what I want you to need do. your sustenance. I, I, exactly. And, you know, is that a fat joke? I know. <laughs> we all need our food. So, um, that's one thing that's definitely in there. I also put in there, look, if there's, if I can't be there, I'll do my best to make sure that I have someone else to, to mm -hmm. put in my place, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, it's just basically just little stuff, okay. you know, like, um, when the, the money is due, I actually, here's a tip. I actually split, uh, the, the payments up for weddings up in thirds, mm -hmm. first third to hold the date, the second third, about 60 days before the wedding. And then the last third when they pick up their proofs. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I do that is actually twofold. Number one, I get two thirds of my money up front mm -hmm. before I do the event instead of only half. And the other thing is, is that it's easier for them to pay a third ahead mm -hmm. and then a third right before the wedding. Mm -hmm. And then the final third they can use from the money out of the wedding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so gifts. it's actually easier for them to pay for that, mm -hmm. especially with our economy right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, Brides are all uh, groomed, you know, they're, they're, they got to pay for the whole thing themselves. So it's usually a little bit easier to split it up in thirds rather than just half. Do you do anything with your sitting fees with the contract too, or is it just pretty much here's, um, your, here's your invoice and you? It's, yeah, it's just by the invoice. Okay. Just by the invoice. And, you know, they'll know what the pricing is ahead of time, mm -hmm. you know, for prints, for the session, for uh, major editing, that kind of thing. My simple editing is all included. Just blemished removal, stuff like that. I just include it anymore. I stopped charging extra for it. Yeah, that makes sense. But um, major editing, like moving faces, moving bodies, moving stuff around like that, and there's a, there's a slight charge. And do you do that in Photoshop? Yes. A lot of times it's in Photoshop. Because you can't do any of that in Lightroom, right? Moving heads and things? No. No, because you're, you're working with two separate images. Typically, you know, you're, it's not like you have the same kid in the same photo. You can't copy from one photo and put it onto another right. in Lightroom. So you need to have Photoshop okay. in order to do that. You can't even move it around in the same photo, can you, with Lightroom? You can a little bit with like the clone stamp kind of idea. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah. A, a little bit, That'd but be not hard much. To do, yeah. Yeah, it, it's impossible. It's really only for blemishes or maybe dust spots mm -hmm. on your, on your um, sensor. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that is really all I use it for. Anything else, it just it goes into Photoshop and then save the PSD file and I'm done. So are you going to do some lessons on Photoshop then too eventually? <laughs> You're going to do I don't know. I'm world. definitely not the king of Photoshop. Yeah, okay. Uh, I've been using it for 10 years or something since yeah. version 4.5. But um, I think I'm much better in Lightroom. And again, that's it's pretty rare when I need to take a photo in Photoshop. Yeah. Give me a percentage. I've heard like 70 to 80 percent Lightroom for most for a lot of people. It's probably 90 something percent 90. for me. Okay. Yeah. 100. And that's for not me. <laughs> and that's not bragging. Yeah. That's right. not bragging, but you know it's very rare when I actually need to do some more editing. Right. Well, it's the kind something. of photography that you want to do too. The yep. images that you want are fairly natural. Mm -hmm. All right. Real quick, what kind of routine maintenance do you do on your camera, and how often? Um, get the sensor cleaned as often as you can, and just be careful about dusty situations. Keep it clean, keep the water off. Uh, there was actually a post that somebody talked about the other day. Well, what do you do to keep it dry? Well, don't, don't take it in. outside, <laughs> number right. one, in the rain. Yeah. Number two, get a think tank hydrophobia if you do have to shoot out in the rain or something like that and just mm -hmm. keep it keep it dry, keep it clean, and you know you don't have any problems. 
you won't have to worry about. Is the sensor cleaning just a function on the on the camera, or do you have to open it up and use the Some cameras. Power? Yeah, some cameras you do, do that, but when you get the sensor cleaning, I'm a fan of just sending it back to Nikon, having them clean it, and send mm -hmm. it back. Okay. Um, do that maybe once a year, once every two years, or whenever it gets starts to get really bad. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not a fan of cleaning my own sensor. It always seems to get smudged or just right. not perfect. And, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, and then you mess it up worse. I want it to be perfect, mm -hmm. so I'd rather just send it in and have them done. Excellent. All right, so we're back out shooting again, and we're in the blazing sun on the baseball field, and mm -hmm. the coach wants a team picture. There's no way to hide. There's no shade. What do we do? Typically, I will put the subjects in between me and the sun. So the sun is at the subject's backs and yep. in your face. And I'm facing them. Okay. Exactly. So there's a few functions there. Number one, put your lens hood on. So not Gotta have sun it. flare. Exactly. Okay. You're not going to have flare, you know, that straight light coming in, hitting mm -hmm. the, the element of the lens. If, it's, if the sun's too far down, you're not going to have much of a choice. Maybe just change your angle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, not as much to get the sun coming in from the side of their face, still, still be you know, back behind, mm -hmm. but uh, just enough so that you're not getting flare or just put something in front of the lens so that it's So on the side of the lens, it. so that, okay. Yeah, it could be your hand, or it could be mm -hmm. someone else standing there in front of you, or mm -hmm. maybe you hide behind a tree or something like that, <laughs> whatever. There's something to shade the lens okay. so that it's not, the, that mm -hmm. it's not getting in there. Mm -hmm. All right, um, that's number one. Number two, I'd say, uh, thing and be sure of is exposure. Um, just open up a hair. You know, your the hair might go a little overexposed, might be a little hot, but the skin tone in that situation is what really matters. Um, you're going to have some, you know, shaded. You're going to have shade in the face, so or you know, it's shadowed side. So you need to open up a little bit in order to make that really work. So, so your light meter on your camera is going to look a little overexposed, but it's not. Yeah, okay. it's going to look, it's, in general, yes, you are overexposing, mm -hmm. but it's probably only a third of a stop, maybe two-thirds of a stop. It's just a little bit in order to get what you think is a normal exposure on the skin tones in the face. So when you bring your picture up, is the sky going to be blown out? It might be a little bit, yep. Mm -hmm. But again, what matters matter, right? is, the, is mm -hmm. the, you know, you're, you're working with what you have in that situation. You don't right. have a choice. So, would you leave that alone in Lightroom, or would you try to do some recovery? Uh, I'd probably try a little bit, mm -hmm. especially to try and get a little bit of sky, mm -hmm. if possible. Although mm -hmm. it's probably you're probably not going to get It'll it. Be gone. Yeah. yeah. Now I found sometimes when you recover, it seems to get a little grainy. Is that true? It can. Okay. It can. The other option that you have is to add a little flash. Right. You know, add a little fill flash, especially if you can get it off camera. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's another really okay. good option. Mm -hmm. um, the easiest setting to put it on, especially if you have one of the Nikon flashes, is the TTL BL mode. Backlight. That's a backlight mode. Okay, and so that would that'll mix the available light with the flash very well, mm -hmm. and so that'll help balance it a little bit. If you really had some super deep shadows and you wanted to get rid of it, mm -hmm. get rid of those shadows and balance the sun with what's on their face mm -hmm. you can use the flash where are you going to put the flash uh definitely recommend getting it off camera right just, you know or arms off length away okay. off to the side a little bit maybe you know maybe a 45 degree angle 30 degree angle something like that um maybe a little bit higher and down mm -hmm. okay the main thing is is get everybody posed where you want them mm -hmm. and i know kids don't always want to stand <laughs> still but you do the best you can uh-huh and then walk over and stand right behind the flash mm -hmm. and look at everybody's faces, mm -hmm. okay? When you're looking at their faces, you're making sure that the, the angle that the flash is on is going to hit the entire mask of the face, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I had someone here and the flash is coming from the camera angle, mm -hmm. I'm that, that flash isn't going to hit me. It's going to hit the person in front of me. Right. Whereas if their head was here, you might need to move them back a little bit. Mm -hmm. That means they're going to get flash and I'm going to get flash. Ah, I gotcha. So you stand right behind that flash and you look at them and then either adjust the flash or adjust the person, so you really have whichever to think is it out. easier, mm -hmm. and, and think about it. And also consider the height that you have it at. Mm -hmm. So that could make a difference. You know, that could be better or worse. Most of the time it's better, but it could also be worse. With the flash. With the flash, because you could end up Big casting shadows. more shadow from one person to another. Makes sense. And it's not as much 
the shadow on a single person's face, mm -hmm. it's one person casting a shadow on another one that's preventing them from getting any kind of light on They're their being face. Being seen, right, yep. that makes sense. So that's another good way, you know, get, get used to using your flash, can make a big mm -hmm. difference. That's gonna be my next jump because I am not comfortable <laughs> with that yet. I mean, okay. I have a nice flash as per your recommendation, yep. good. but I don't really use it because I don't know how to use it. I don't want to use it wrong. Yep, we'll work on that. Excellent. <laughs> you heard it. And everybody's going to benefit from it. <laughs> Excellent. So given that, I mean, you, um, talking about gear, one of the things that you'd said in the ebook is to purchase good gear. Yep. Um, and I have a lot of not good gear from before I knew what good gear was. Mm -hmm. um, I thought spending $400 on a lens was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And it is, but not when you're looking for the kind of lenses that I want now. Yep. So, not when you want the flexibility and quality. Yeah. Absolutely. And speed, I've mm -hmm. found with with that too. With focus, yep. Yes. Um, so you know that my only good lens is my 70 to 200. Mm -hmm. What do I need next? The 24 to 70 is your next buy. Mm -hmm. You have a, like an 18 to 50 something kit lens, right? Yes, 105 okay. or one something. Um, yeah. Well, you know what? Let me rephrase that. Your next lens you probably want to buy is the 17 to 55. Mm -hmm. Whether it's the Sigma, whether it's the Nikon, mm -hmm. pick one. The Canon, mm -hmm. if you had a Canon camera, the Canon 17 to 55 is actually mm -hmm. another really good lens. Mm -hmm. The 2.8 version, mm -hmm. not the anything else. Okay. You want the 2.8 one. Um, but since you have a D7000, highly recommend getting the Nikon one. Mm -hmm. They run around $1,300, $1,400 mm -hmm. new. Maybe you can get them used a little bit less mm -hmm. than that really sharp lens. You are going to be missing a little bit of range between the 55 to 70 range. Mm -hmm. But as I always say to everybody, you can just take, take a, step a step farther. <laughs> you know, you, you have these great built in crop tools at the end of your <laughs> end of your legs and use them. So yeah. you can, you know, get a little closer, back up a little bit and you're not going to miss that little bit of range in between. So is but that going to give me a wider angle lens? Much, oh, okay. much. That's going to give you a nice, really nice 17 millimeter, super wide, mm -hmm. you know, lens, which is pretty much as wide as you're going to be able to get um, without a reasonable amount of distortion mm -hmm. on a DX camera. Okay. Okay. You can get down to like, when you hit like 10 millimeter, something like that, 12 millimeter on a DX camera, you're going to get a fisheye. Mm -hmm. somewhere in that range so depending upon how the lens is made mm -hmm. so 17 is about your your widest without a whole lot of distortion All right. and it's very well controlled on that 17 to 55 lens mm -hmm. so okay, excellent now, lens i now do understand what a wide angle lens is okay. but just starting out i didn't really understand that concept so yep. since we're sitting here talking about it and this is for the benefit of people like me Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain what wide angle Wide means? angle gets a lot of stuff in the picture. So it's really wide. You can zoom it out. You can get a lot of stuff in the picture. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a wide zoom is, I uh, say, it's at that 17 to 55. Mm -hmm. And then a telephoto is the other end, which is longer lens, which has a higher number, uh, 70 to 200, 300 millimeter, 400 millimeter. They're telephoto lenses, and they're going to have a very small angle of view and crop it in really, really tight. So you're getting less in your picture. Yep. Right. Yep. But it's going to make a, um, going to make things better. You're not going to be cropping as much. You get that really nice bokeh that we talked about, all mm -hmm. that stuff. So what about, what's the fisheye do? Uh, the fisheye kind of gives you like a, like a round, like a fun house mirror kind of thing. Okay. okay. That's what that's doing. It's making it look a little weird. But again, it's one of those things that I feel needs to be used in moderation. Yeah, I was just asking um, what would the purpose for that be? It's it's just a it's a fun lens that you can use, but like when I shoot a wedding with it, mm -hmm. you can only do like one or two scenes with that lens. Mm -hmm. you, you can't overdo it. Mm -hmm. um, Too much of a good thing. Exactly. That's why that's why nobody ever does the whole um, single color, like the rose that's in red and then everything else everything, in black. Yeah. Just don't do it anymore. Yeah. Just stay away from it. Don't do it. It's been overdone. It just, it doesn't look good. You know, that was 15 years ago when right. I was playing with Photoshop, you know. It was a 90s thing. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. So just stay away from that now. And if you do get a fisheye, use it in moderation. All right. How about a macro lens? Is that just for taking insects and flowers? And no, it, you can actually do some really cool stuff with macro lenses. Um, I use them more for, say, the main two things that I use them for are, are flowers or scenic stuff, mm -hmm. maybe some product photography, 
and then the third would be I almost always use it for ring photos. Okay. Uh, I was gonna guess at that. the at the wedding, you know, at mm -hmm. weddings and stuff. Um, you know, because you want to be able to zoom it in nice and tight. You get really good detail. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Right. And by the way, when you zoom in farther with that lens, you're also going to have more uh, a shallower depth of field again. Mm -hmm. Okay? You have a very, very shallow depth, shallow depth of field with a macro lens. Okay. So, makes sense. you know, you're going to have like a couple of millimeters of, of depth of field when you wow. zoom in, when you get real, real close. Mm -hmm. Okay? And again, it's that same idea of getting real close and that focus distance is closing in. It gets, it gets really, really shallow. Mm -hmm. So then you'll need to be at 5.6, f8, f11. And so you actually do need to, wow. to open up or to close down, I should say, in order right. to get yeah, more, more depth of field. Okay. Okay. So once I get that new lens for Christmas, uh -huh. <laughs> what would be the third lens? Because I know you talk about you know, the trifecta. Um, that really comes down to what you are shooting more of. Um, you do more sports, mm -hmm. you're probably going to want to look at some kind of a 300 millimeter lens. <laughs> are we talking big time bucks with that? You are. Okay. Um, you can get the Nikon or the Canon, sorry, the Sigma 120 to 300. They run around, I think, around 2200, 2300 used. Mm -hmm. So that's not too bad, and it's mm -hmm. still a zoom. Mm -hmm. It's not going to have the quality of a fixed 300 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. but it's going to be more flexible. Yeah, okay. which is important with sports because things change so quickly. Exactly. So I've often thought about buying that lens. I never did. I just went straight for the 300. Mm -hmm. And um, you can borrow mine when I get it. There you go. So I think that's that's a good compromise and it's a good mm -hmm. stepping stone lens. The other nice thing about it, not only is it inexpensive, it's going to hold its value. You, this if is you, the Sigma. You're talking the Sigma. Yeah, the mm -hmm. Sigma 120 to 300. Mm -hmm. It's going to hold its value. Say you spend 2400 2500 on it now, what new or used, whatever the price mm -hmm. may be, okay? Then in a year or two when you sell it, it's probably only going to be three or $400 less that you wow. sell it for. So it's going to, good glass holds its value. It doesn't depreciate much. Yeah, so that's a good thing. You're going to be able to get a lot more yeah. money out of it. Same with your 70 to 200. You're going to, if you were to, when you sell that in 10 years, mm -hmm. you're probably going to get... 75% of wow. the of its value maybe you know definitely no less than 60% of its original cost obviously there's the the inflation all that stuff isn't really factored mm -hmm. in but you know you're still going to get a good portion of what that original that was originally sold that for back. back so how, where do you go to find a good used lens that you trust um whatever your main thing is is checking it out mm -hmm. uh, when i got my i actually bought my 300 off of ebay and the guy actually showed me the paperwork from Nikon that it was just checked out. Okay. So that makes a big difference. Find a reputable person. It's you, like Carfax for cars. It can be. Uh -huh. Yeah, it can be. And you do need to be careful because, you know, documents can be fake. But uh -huh. the guy had a good reputation of selling. And I got his you know, personal information. It was personal email and everything. We were going back and forth. So I felt good about it. Uh -huh. Um Craigslist can be another place for for great deals on gear because you can actually touch it and feel it and shoot photos with it before you ever buy it. Yeah. You know, I've met a bunch of people in the past for buying equipment and I've said, no, thank you. I don't want it after touching it and feeling it and mm -hmm. looking at it. Yeah. Whereas if I was on eBay, I would have been SOL. Right. So, you know, Chris Craigslist can be another good way to go. Um, if you have a good local dealer that's not going to go overboard on pricing, that gives you good mm -hmm. pricing, then that's a that's another good way too because okay. they're not going to take anything in that's crap. Right. You know they're they're going to have a good judge of, of what's good and what's bad. Okay. How about camera bodies? I read somewhere that camera bodies have a certain number of photos that you Ugh. shouldn't go above. Ugh, don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> don't worry about it. It's okay. Um, put it this way: you go to buy a car. Mm -hmm. Okay. A decent used car is going to have 50,000 miles on it, mm -hmm. and that's probably a quarter of its life, mm -hmm. okay? A camera is the same way, 200, 300,000 pictures. Why are you going to worry about a camera that has 15 to 20,000 pictures on it? That's not even a quarter of its life. It's 10% you know of its life. Maybe it's got a ton more. What about, the, what about the used car? It's the same idea, <clears throat> okay? You still have to get it serviced. You still have to be careful with it. You still got to keep it out of the rain. You still got to, you know, make sure that it's in good 
good condition. But you still want the car with lower mileage. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. But don't worry about it as much. Cameras are made to last a long time. Mm -hmm. They're gonna. It's gonna. You know, the 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 hundred and fifty thousand on a pro or on a on a consumer camera is their minimum, mm -hmm. and the three hundred thousand on the pro bodies is their minimum. You know, that's nothing to a to a pro body. So don't worry about it. So you don't think I have enough to pay don't attention worry about to it. that? No, no. Okay. Not a big deal. <laughs> okay. I mean, unless a camera has you know two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand clicks on it. And even then, I would still buy it if I needed it. Okay. So what? If it's made it that far, it's probably going to make it for everything that I need. Should it affect the pricing? Um, I personally don't think so. Okay. Other people think otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's a psychological thing. Just like you said, you want the car with less mileage. That means you're going to pay more money for it. Yeah, but you're hopefully going to have it longer. True. And it's going to last longer. True. So you know, it really depends on okay. what what your your point of view is and. To me, it's not a big deal. Okay. If it looks good, the sensor's clean, it takes good pictures, it feels good, it was serviced recently, it's fine. It's good to go. Yeah. All right, so let's end on something personal. What are your favorite things to shoot? Favorite is definitely portraits. All right. Definitely. Whether it's kids, whether it's adults, whether it's anything, uh, whether it's a wedding, mm -hmm. you know, that's all considered to be a portrait to me. Do you mind if it's one person or two people or multiple people? Uh, I think I like one person a little bit more because it's more intimate. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Interactive. Yeah, more interactive. And um, I feel that I can kind of squeeze more out of them, you know, <laughs> that way. <laughs> and nice get a, get a Get a better, um, I don't want to say a better image, but yeah. uh, get a little bit better rapport with them. And the personality will come exactly, out more. Exactly, exactly. That's... Um, I typically don't have an assistant for that reason because I think that assistant kind of gets in the way. Kind of kind of breaks that and kind of it's not a good icebreaker and you know what I mean it kind of okay. messes it up. So how about least what are the things that you think are or the hardest or your The one thing I definitely hate, I will say this 100% is uh table shots at a wedding. Oh, okay. Boring. I, Hate uh -huh. them with a passion. Uh -huh. the, when I the photographer that I first started working for, they would have me go up on a ladder and do these table uh -huh. shots, and I hated them. So the, to this day, uh -huh. I still hate and I still refuse to do table shots. I hate Just them. They're boring. Or they're because... boring. The people are have their mouth full of food and their tables oh, messy. Oh, you mean with and, people? And stuff. Yeah, gotcha. all that okay. stuff. You know, at a, at, a, at a wedding. Uh -huh. Ugh, terrible. Yeah. Terrible. Don't do them. Stay away from them. Talk nobody, the bride out of it. They're not going to buy them anyway. And so nobody I, likes to get their picture taken then anyway. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's my, my definitely my least, least favorite. favorite. But I like product photos because they're typically a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, scenic is fun because I just get out to go by myself and mm -hmm. or with somebody else. So it's yeah. a good thing. So Very good. All right. Any more questions? Oh, lots. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to save them for another time, Absolutely. huh? Absolutely. All right. Sounds good. Well, um, another 30, 40 minutes, whatever, whatever it's been, questions with Kathy. Uh, maybe we'll have some more. Or, like I said, all the people are going to have to be named Kathy from now on. <laughs> we'll just give them the name tag of Kathy, yeah, whether it's a works. male or a female. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you very much. Greg Cazillo, Cazillo.com. See you.